Today, uh, I'm preaching a little bit different from the way I normally preach. This, this is a, what I'm calling a narrative sermon. Somebody say narrative. narrative. I want to tell you a story. This is a sermon in the, in the format of a story. So while I'm preaching, I'm sure God will speak to you. Jot down whatever he says to you. Um, it's a complex story. The story is very complex, but I'm going to try to simplify it for you. So, so don't get distracted because if you miss one little thing, you might get lost in the whole, the whole detail of the story. But I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can for you. Y'all know I started a series a couple weeks ago on forgiveness. And I'm continuing that today on forgiveness. And I want to talk about a guy in the Bible named Ahithophel. Ahithophel. Uh, 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 <laughs> it's a tough name. That's why I'm going to call him Phil for the rest of this sermon. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, Pastor going to talk about Phil for the rest of this sermon. <laughs> Open your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16. Now you're gonna need a Bible. I hope you I hope if you don't if you don't have a Bible, get close to somebody, steal somebody's from in front of you, or borrow somebody's, sit next to somebody, because I'm gonna be looking at a lot of different passages and I need you to be able to flow with me so you can follow it. Second Samuel 16 is where I'm coming from. Now in verse number 23 is the place we first hear mention of this fella named Ahithophel. And here's what the Bible says about Phil. Verse 23, now the advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as if one had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the advice of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. Here, here's what the Bible says. When this man talked, it was just like you were talking to God. To talk to him was like talking to God. Now that's an incredible thing. I don't know where y'all want to be in your life. Where I want to be in my life is I want to be able to hear from God. I want to be able to speak God's word. And Phil's posture in life was he was so tuned into God and so uh, connected with God and so insightful of the things and ways of God that when people needed advice, they would come to him. And when they came to him, it was just as if they were talking to God. Now, I wonder who people think they be talking to when they talk to you. <laughs> there y'all go getting quiet on the brother again. His ability to see life from God's perspective was phenomenal. He spoke on God's behalf. He, could, he, he gave advice to kings, political leaders, people. He was the go-to man. He was the dog. He was the one that everybody came to. He was the dude. He was the man that everybody came to advice because when he talked, he talked as the oracles of God. And that's an incredible thing. It's an incredible place to be, to be so wise, so insightful, so empowered, to have God communicate with you in such a way that whenever you talk, people knew they were hearing from God. Isn't that incredible? Wouldn't you like to be like that? And that's the posture that this man is in. For in 2 Samuel 16, verse 23, the Bible says that his was advice was just as if you were talking to God. But when you flip over to chapter 17, one chapter later, and in verse 23, it says in verse 23 of chapter 17, now when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey and arose and went home to his house, to his city. Then he put his household in order and hanged himself and died. Now how does a guy go from being on one side of the plate, an oracle of God, speaking as though he's talking, he's, when people talk to him, they think they're talking to God, and then just one chapter later, just a few days later, we find this man in a posture of place where he has become so frustrated and so disappointed and so angry at life that he hangs himself. It's an amazing transition and change, but yet it's happening every day. 
Every day, people start off with a walk with God and a talk with God and a relationship with God, and they make certain choices and decisions and do certain things that they find themselves ultimately in a place of suicide and frustration with life. And the question is, what led this man who on one moment was the mouthpiece of God, and yet on the next moment, he finds himself in a position of utter despair. What would cause a person to have everybody come and seeking his advice and yet just a few days later finds himself in a utterly frustrated point to the place where he planned this. He went home and got his stuff in order and went and hanged himself. Y'all want to know what it was? I said, do y'all want to know what it was? He was bitter bitterness. Phil became bitter. And if you want to know what has the capacity to take you out and change your perspective of life and destroy your ability to commune and hear from God and mess up your destiny, it is bitterness. That's why I'm titling, I'm I am the name of this message is <laughs> The Danger of Bitterness. The Danger of of bitterness. Phil got so bitter and who he got bitter with is amazing. He got bitter with his boss. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, uh-oh, look at here. <laughs> he got bitter with the person who he served. He got bitter with his boss who was David. Now, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about life. I promise you during the course of your life that either personally or professionally, somebody's going to do something that's going to piss you or uh, tick you off. <laughs> forgot, I, I forgot I got to use the right language. Just keep living, keep on experiencing, keep on walking in life, keep on doing what you do, keep on living, keep on interacting with people. I promise you somebody's going to do something that's going to make you mad. Somebody's going to do something that's going to want to make you cuss them out, give them a piece of their mind, tell them where to go, where to shove it, where to take it, what to do with it. Y'all ain't got to say nothing. Somebody's going to do something. It's just a matter of time. Just keep living, I promise you. And it happened to Phil. Something happened in Phil's life that he became bitter, but Phil never got over his bitterness. He never got to a place where he could handle his bitterness. He never transitioned. He never moved from being bitter to forgiving. He held on to his bitterness and it led to the destruction of his life. It caused him not to fulfill his destiny. It caused him to lose his gift, his ministry, and ultimately it cost him his life. The grave is full of people, y'all, who died having never fulfilled their promises in life and their destiny and the things that God said that they would be, having never fulfilled it. Why? Because they never could get past Bitterness Boulevard. Some of y'all like Bitterness Boulevard. Y'all live on it. You got several houses on Bitterness Boulevard, so you, you've built a string of houses so that you have an opportunity with, while you're traveling, when you get tired, you just go in and camp in at a particular place and hang there and sleep for the night and get up and continue on your journey. And the only place you're going is up and down Bridges Boulevard. You're not getting on any other street. You're not getting on Blessing Lane. You're not making it to Prosperity Place because you stuck on Bitterness Boulevard. Go on and preach, Pastor. It is impossible for you to reach the destiny that God has for you. It's impossible for you to become everything God wants you to become. It's impossible for you to reach the assignment and the call that God has for you while you're carrying around on the backs of your shoulder and in the, the corridors of your heart, bitterness. You can never become what God wants you to be while you remain bitter. Thank those 17 people for that rounding affirmation of that very, of that very profound point. Well, who was he bitter with and why did he get bitter? Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Flip back just a few chapters. Now, I don't have time to give you the full breadth of this story in chapter 11, but I'm going to hit bits and pieces in certain verses so that you can try to get a feel for it. 
It says in verse one, and it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Verse two, then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. Now here's the king, gets out of, goes out to his rooftop one time, up on the roof. He's up on the roof, up on the roof. Some of y'all know that song. <laughs> and he peers over and he sees a woman taking a bath. And she's beautiful to behold. And in verse 3 it says, So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is, not, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. They got word to him, David, that is Eliam's daughter and Uriah's wife. And what did he do? In verse 4, he sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. The king knew that Uriah, her husband, was a soldier and he was off at war. And so David said, bring her to me. And so the messengers went and got her and brought her to his palace. And David slept with her. And after he slept with her, after he got what he wanted, he sent her on back home. Ain't that like a man? Come on, talk to me. I'm trying to help you sisters out. If y'all ain't going to say amen, I mean... She was married, but he used the position of this power of his king and disregarded that. And he took the fact that he knew that her husband was off at war battling for him in his stead and brought her to his chambers and slept with her. And then in verse 5, he, the Bible says, and the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. There's the words that no man wants to hear. Come on, brothers, you don't want to hear that word, I miss my period. You don't want to hear that word. She didn't say she missed a period. She had missed several periods. She said, I'm with child. I am pregnant. And in verses 6 through 17, I don't have time to read it, y'all. Let me tell it to you. Let me just tell it to you. Let me tell you the story. In verses 6 through 17, David now goes on an elaborate scheme to try to cover up the tracks of what he did. The first thing he does, the first thing David does is beckons and summons for her husband Uriah to come back from the war and come home. Because he thought, now here this man been out at war all his time. And when he comes back, the first thing he'll do is sleep with his wife. And when she has the baby, he will think that the baby is his. I want to talk about that for a few moments, but I don't know if I have time to talk about, about that. So the Bible says Uriah came back, back from war, hadn't been with his wife, for many months, and what does he do? He sleeps outside on the steps. Look at your neighbor and say, he was not a black man. Go ahead, turn to your neighbor and say, he was not. Y'all might as well come on and say amen. You know when, you know when homeboy coming home, he got to go see mama first? Come on, talk to me in just a second. Y'all act like, come on now, can we talk? It's just us here. Can we talk and be honest? Can we just be honest with each other for us? Can't we just get along here today? No, he doesn't sleep with his wife. He, he says, and so when, you, when the king finds out he hadn't slept with his wife, he calls him, man, what's, what's up with this dog? You didn't go home, you didn't go see your wife? He said, said, King, I can't sleep with my wife. 
We're in battle. We got a war going on. I can't sleep with my wife while the Ark of the Covenant is in foreign hands, while, while the, my brothers are out in battle, and me sleep with my wife. I can't do it. He wasn't a brother. And so the king says, I'll come up with another scheme. And so what he did is he got Uriah drunk. He invited him to a, a feast, a party, and got him drunk, thinking that in his drunken stupor, he would somehow make his way into his house and not realize that through the night he actually had sex with his wife. But even in his drunken stupor, Uriah still stayed outside his house. Seeing that he couldn't get that worked out, David came up with another plan. He wrote a letter to the king, the general. He wrote, the king wrote a letter to the general, and the letter in essence said, put Uriah in the midst of the hottest battle. And when the battle letter is at its hottest, pull back support and let me know when he's dead. And that's exactly what David did. He wrote that letter. And you know what he did? Now, this joker is something. He gave the letter, sealed the letter in an envelope, gave it to Uriah to take it to the general to give to the general. He carried his own. Y'all don't need to watch no soap operas. Just read the Bible. There's enough drama right here, right here in the Bible. It's enough. It's right here in the Bible. Read this, just read this chapter 11. It's, so Uriah carried his own death sentence back to the king. The king read it and did exactly, um, the, the general read it and did exactly what the king said. He put Uriah in the hottest heat of the battle and when the battle got hot, he pulled the support soldiers away and Uriah got killed. And verse 27 of chapter 11 says that then after Bathsheba had mourned for a season, the Bible says David took her into his house as his wife. Does your Bible say that? He takes Bathsheba, verse 27, and when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. Look at what verse 27 also says. It says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Let me tell y'all something. When you so, so it looks, let me tell you something. It seemed like he done got away with this now. So he done, he just worked this out. He tried to get Uriah to sleep with his, with, with his wife. He wouldn't. And so now he's put him in the front of the line and he's killed and he's taken this woman as his wife now. So it looks like he's made it and he's gotten away with it. But let me tell you a little secret. When you think you've covered your track, your model will understand that though you think you've gotten away with it, God still sees what you've done. And that's in fact probably the hardest thing to make people understand is that no matter what you do, God sees exactly what you've done. That's a difficult thing for people to understand because you think you got away with it. Just because lightning and thunder didn't come down when you walked up and got out of the room and put your clothes on, just because when you finished taking the drugs, just after you finished lying, lightning and thunder didn't come down, doesn't mean that God didn't see what you've done. So David thought everything was smooth now, but there was a problem. His actions were not a secret. He thought he had gotten away with it. But his trusted advisor, Phil, had heard about it. Ahithophel had heard about what David had done and he became bitter. Now, now, have I confused y'all yet? Y'all following the story pretty good? Phil became so bitter with David that he, this is what he did, he resigned from being in David's cabinet and joined up with a rebel who was trying to take over David's kingdom named Absalom. Let me preach the sermon now, just a second, dog. Yes, David's son Absalom is trying to take over his father's kingdom, and Ahithophel leaves David's camp and joins with the rebel camp of Absalom. 
His bitterness, Phil's bitterness, had gotten so intense that he could no longer work with or for David. Now, why did Phil get so upset? Why did he get so angry? Why did he get so bitter? His bitterness was so strong. Let me tell you why. Look at, look at chapter 11 and verse number uh, 3. In verse, chapter 11, verse 3, it says, So David sent and inquired about the woman, and listen to this, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the, the Hittite? Here's who she is. Bathsheba is the daughter of Eliam. Do y'all see that? Now do me a favor and slide over to chapter 23. Slide over to chapter 23, and, and I want to read for you just one little a portion of verse number 34, and, and maybe, uh, maybe it will give you some insight into what the deal was, because in the midst of verse number 34, we see that Eliam was the son of Ahithophel. So Ahithophel had Gilliam, Eliam, and Eliam had Bathsheba. And so in essence, what made this man get upset, Phil got upset because David had violated his granddaughter and her husband. Now I went through all of that. I went through all of this because y'all don't read your Bible. I wish y'all read your Bible and I wouldn't have to give you all this story. But I had to walk you through this whole story to bring you to this point, which is that the man David did not do anything to Ahithophel himself. He did something to his relative and he took offense with it. And I need to talk about it because some of y'all have picked up bitterness, not because somebody did something to you, but they did it to a friend or to a relative or to a co-worker or to a neighbor and you picked up an offense. You have got angry, you got upset, you, you are just like Phil. This guy got so bitter and so angry and so upset that he quit David's camp and joined with the rebel Absalom because of what David did to his granddaughter and her husband. I wonder how many relationships you've cut off, how many jobs you've left, how many churches you've quit and gone to another church, not because somebody did something to you, but they did something to somebody you know. There's a lesson to learn here. And my assignment is to take these last six minutes of my message, last six minutes that I have, six minutes or so, <laughs> and try to highlight for you three critical points that I think that everybody needs to learn from this message. What are those three points? Here's the first one. Seeking to hurt those who hurt you only hurts you. When you seek to hurt those who hurt you or hurt others, it hurts you. You think you're doing damage to them, but ultimately, really, you're doing damage to yourself. You think you're paying them back, but really, you're the one that's having the drama. They done gone on with their life. You still fuming, breathing, mad. Every time that name come up, you sucking teeth. <laughs> you rolling eyes. They come in the room, you walking out, they having a party. They at the party having fun, you done left the party because they came in. <laughs> Your life is miserable, they ain't have no drama. Their life is going on, they done forgot about what they did to you and you all uptight, upset and mad and now you trying to hurt them because they hurt you and really the only person who's being hurt is you. You know what I made a decision? I made a decision in my mind that the people who are trying to hurt me, hurt my name, hurt my reputation, hurt my family, hurt my ministry, they are not worth me getting upset and mad with them. I'm, old, I'm rolling on with my life. Can I get an amen somewhere? 
Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't worth me getting all upset about. You're not worth me losing my destiny. You're not worth me losing my assignment. You're not worth me losing my call. You're not worth me getting my relationship with God jacked up. You're not worth me missing out on what God has for me. I ain't going to get all jacked up mad and bitter because of what you did. You are not worth me missing out on what God has for me. Is it really worth it? Come on, that joker gone on. He was somebody else. He done gone to another woman and you still mad with him. Come on, baby, get over it, girl. <laughs> Tell yourself, I done cried the last tear for that joker. I done cried my last tear for you. I done lost my lost sleep over you for the last time. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Does anybody hear what I'm saying to you? When I, you know what I believe? Here's what I believe. I believe when you try to hurt somebody that hurts you or hurt somebody else, you try to get them back, you, you, you supersede and step in the place of God. Because here's what the Bible says. In Romans 12, it's God's, here's what scripture says. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That's what God said, I'll pay him back. But here's what happens, when you step in and decide you're gonna pay him back, here, now I ain't got no scripture for this, this is just my own personal thought about this. When you step in and you try to take over, I think God says, oh, you got this one. A ain't no need of me doing nothing, you got it under control, but here, let me tell you something. It's best to let God deal with it, because when God deals with it, it will be dealt with. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When God deals with it, it will be dealt with. But as long as you got your mouth on the situation, your heart in the situation, your hands in the situation, God can't do nothing. Take your hands off and let God deal with it. Those who hurt, those who hurt you, you're only hurting yourself. Ahithophel joined Absalom's camp to try to hurt David, but he ended up really only hurting himself. But there's a second point I need to give you before I let you go. And that's this, God is the one who judges those who do, who do wrong. God is the ultimate judge. He's the one that execu sends execution and judgment. He's God, he don't need your help. God been God a long time, he don't need you to help. He don't need your help to carry out his plans. Ahithophel tried to hurt David, but he didn't understand God had already passed the decree of judgment on David. Amen. Jot down this, I don't have time to turn to it, but jot down 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 10. Several things happened in chapter 12. In chapter 12, not only did David and Bathsheba lose the baby that was born, the baby died. Not only was that judgment, but also on top of that, God said to them in verse 10, the sword shall never depart from your house. There'll be wars and fightings within your family forever. God had already sent the judgment, but now here Phil is trying to help God out. How many of y'all know God don't need your help? Let me give you my third and final point. But on that one, I need you to turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, and let me, let me tell you this while, you, while you're turning there. And this is, then I'm, then I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to let you go after this. David had a prophet come to his house named Nathan in chapter 12. And Nathan prophesied, or actually he told a story to David, to the king. And the story was a reflection of what David had done. Read it when you get an opportunity. God used the prophet to speak to him about what he had just done to Bathsheba and Uriah. And when David saw the, ugly, the ugliness of what he had done, when he saw that he had sinned, when he saw he had violated God's holiness and had done wrong, 
he wept and repented and cried out. And Psalm 51 is the record of what David wrote after he did what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah. And listen to what he said. Look, listen, listen to this, verse 1. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Anybody here got some transgressions they need to have blotted out? Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you might be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Look at that, stop. Look at verse four again. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Here's my third and final point. That ultimately you and I have to understand when people do wrong, it's not against us is against God. All sin is against God alone. Now I know that's a, now listen to y'all, I know that's a tough pill to swallow. And when I've read this passage on many occasions in the past, I had difficulties understanding it. I had difficulties comprehending, especially when I looked at the fact that of what David did. I could think of a slew of people that David offended. I could say David did Uriah wrong, certainly. He did Bathsheba wrong. He did Ahithophel wrong. And we can go on down through a long list of people who had been wronged. But the problem with this is when I look at it from that standpoint, I'm almost implying that people owe me something when the reality is y'all you nor I have a heaven nor hell to put anybody into now I know you want to give people hell but when the judgment seat comes and we all have to stand before God none of us will be standing on the judging side of the seat None of us have a heaven to put people to or take people to or a hell to condemn people to. As a matter of fact, we have no law with which we are to expect others to obey. The problem is that when you think that you are so important and what you want and your respect and what you like and how important you are is so important that everybody else should bow down to you, well, who the heck do you think you are? I almost cussed, but the Holy Ghost kept me. Thank you, Holy Ghost. He kept me. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling. I felt something rising up, but I fought it off, y'all. Who do you think you are to pass a decree as if somebody has to bow down to your expectations? I know I hate to burst your bubble, but you ain't God. Lean over, tell your neighbor, you ain't God. I know you think you are, but you ain't God. Tell him. I said, tell your neighbor, you ain't God. You are not God and for you to go around with an attitude that somebody wronged you and somebody violated you and somebody did something against you as if you are all that you ain't nothing you're just a lump of clay you didn't make the heavens and the earth you didn't create the stars you didn't wake anybody up this morning you didn't heal anybody their sickness or diseases you ain't nobody You are not anybody for anybody to have to bow down. And you know what the tragedy is? Some of y'all have people thinking that they have to keep on bowing down to you because they wronged you. But I understood when I read this passage, it opened my eyes that when it comes to sin, we sin against God. It is his law that we violate. It is his law which we have let down. And it is him to whom we must ultimately answer to. That's why I'm so glad that he sent Jesus to make provisions for my sins to be washed away. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, how precious is that flow that makes me whiter than snow. No other fount I know nothing 
but the blood of Jesus. That's who we have to answer to. And my brothers and sisters, you have sinned, you've done wrong, you violated the laws of God, and I'm telling you, we are in no place to hold somebody else hostage to our expectations as though they've wronged us. So here's my challenge to y'all today, and I'm going to pray. I'm trying to finish this thing, but the Holy Ghost keeps giving me something else to say. I want to pray that the Holy Ghost would call to your mind all the folk who you've carried bitterness against, the people who you can't stand. I would ask you to write their names down, but I don't have enough time before we have to let you out of service for you to finish writing them down. Suffice it to say that if you're harboring anything in your heart against anybody, you cannot be everything that God wants you to be. And I'm here to tell you today, I don't know a single person on the planet that I haven't forgiven for what they've done if I felt I needed to forgive them. And I don't know anybody who I've wronged who I have not tried to make an effort to be reconciled to. I stand before you today with a clear conscience. Not perfect. I'm not a perfect person. But I believe God can use me. Why? Because I don't let bitterness clog up the channel for his love. We hope that you have been blessed by this message from Pastor Jenkins. If you're unsaved or have fallen away from your relationship with Jesus Christ, you just have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart on, right now noise. that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again with all power. Your sins are now forgiven, and you're part of the family of God. Welcome. Maybe you're already saved and in need of a church home, one that will nurture your growth and development as a Christian. Or perhaps you were once in fellowship with God, but have since drifted away and are ready to return to your first love. Whatever the case, we'd love to have you become a part of the First Baptist family. Simply contact us at 301-773-3600 or visit our website at www.fbcglenarden.org for information on any of our convenient services or 100 plus ministries designed to meet your most intimate needs. Pastor John K. Jenkins Sr., First Baptist Church of Glenarden. We are developing dynamic disciples.